Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania is officially out in theaters, so let's talk about it. Let's go. This film has taken over the internet over the past couple of days, mostly because the critics and the audiences can't seem to agree on a simple question. Is this movie actually worth it? Uh? According to the tomato meter, this is the second worst Marvel movie ever, which to me is absolutely ludicrous. The gap is so big, people are starting to question whether the tomato meter is actually valid at all. So in order to answer these two questions, let's take it step by step and figure figure out if Quantumania was actually worth the price of admission. From the jump, we have to establish some key points. Everybody loves Paul Rudd. Hi. I'm Paul Rudd. Ever since the first Ant-Man, we realized that this man was charismatic enough to handle his own franchise, especially playing the character of Scott Lang, AKA Ant-Man. The first movie, to me, is actually really underrated, mostly because of Edgar Wright's amazing writing. The second one was pretty forgettable, I agree. Come on, man! But everything afterward that we have seen Ant-Man in, he's actually been pretty solid. Oh yeah, no, that's what I was thinking. So what the hell is up with Quantumania? Let's talk about the things that actually worked. First and foremost is the exploration of the quantum Realm. This is the closest that the MCU has ever gotten to emulating the sci-fi thrill that we get from movies like Star Wars. It's like poetry, so if they rhyme. Exploring different worlds with different races that have amazing character design. That guy looks like broccoli. Great production and set design with amazing character work, and of course, a lore-rich new universe to explore that has a lot of stuff happening on its own right, not necessarily connected to the main story. The world feels alive. It's alive! Another thing that worked, at least on a surface level, is the relationship between Cassie and and Scott. Cassie. Nope. Both of them try to play off each other and emphasize the fact that their main purpose is to make a difference in the world that surrounds them. Like father, like daughter, they both want to be a catalyst for change. Sometimes that doesn't end up working out for them, but their rocky relationship at the start gets progressively better because of their united efforts. Especially when you consider the weird dichotomy that exists between the grandparents, the parents, and Cassie. Besides that though, there is a lot that didn't work. On one end, I definitely agree with most of the community in saying that the CG CGI was really inconsistent. At this point, we shouldn't be expecting CGI in major productions with massive budgets like this to be lackluster. I'm not saying that we should expect Endgame in every picture, but the fact that we have seen The Mandalorian, House of the Dragon both use the volume to such a degree that we feel like we are alive in this world, and then we get a final project like what we see in Quantumania where some scenes look good and others look like trash, is mind blowing. There should be at least a mild semblance of consistency throughout these projects, which is partially why I agree with Marvel and the fact that they should limit the amount of projects that they put out in a year. So yeah, the CGI is really inconsistent, but the main thing that doesn't work to me is the story structure. It tries to do so much at one time from the exploration of the quantum realm to setting up Kang as the main baddie for phase five and phase six, and then exploring the family relationships between Janet, Hank, Hope, Cassie, and Scott, that it ends up being bland in all aspects. Here. Donut. This is a setup movie through and through. That's not necessarily bad, don't get me wrong. But when you have so much information thrown at you and you're trying to set up so many different plots at once, you are naturally going to divide the audience, especially if you're trying to appeal to critics, which are mostly looking for a singular theater experience. You have to remember, nobody wants to do homework when they're going to the movie theater and escape reality. And yes, in our case, we're super fans. We've been keeping up with the MCU throughout its entire 20 plus year history. But sadly, in doing so, some of the key character arcs that we're trying to close in this end of a trilogy or what it was supposed to be end up being left by the wayside. Even when it comes to the humor, this movie doesn't land as it should. Instead of it being witty banter with some moments of levity, Hiya champ, how was school today? <laughs> in a grandiose, serious story, we get super cringy and repetitive dialogue Thank you, Spider-Man! that it loses most of the charm that we know these stories can achieve from the first installments. Hi. So, after covering all of this, why should I even watch this movie? The answer is exactly what you think. Ants. Ants. Jonathan Majors as Kang the Conqueror. Honestly, mi pana, they should have renamed this movie instead of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, it should have been Kang the Conqueror setting up the dynasty. The only ways I can truthfully describe Jonathan Majors' performance in this bad boy is three simple words. Gravitas, power, and confidence. The lead up to his introduction as the Conqueror was worth the wait. He feels like an even greater threat than Thanos. Bruh. Mostly because of the amazing range that Jonathan Majors has as an actor. And you need an actor to be able to pull that off. And that is Jonathan Majors. And uh, the scale of what he's trying to achieve in this universe. And I will burn them out of time. Or should I say, the multiverse. Multiverse is real. 
Although he doesn't seem as physically overpowering as Thanos did, he is tactically and psychologically ahead of everybody else in this realm. Especially considering the fact that we know he has taken down the Avengers before. So it leaves you fiending for more, wanting to see him at his best. There are no random jokes like in Thor Love and Thunder with Gore the God Butcher. This is a serious man. It was truthfully a sight to behold. With that said, Modok, yeah, Modok looks horrible. But I am not particularly going to dock that many points from the film itself because Modok is wacky and weird in the comics as well. In this movie, they made him the center of the comedic relief. His design and humor and his overall demeanor is cringy. We knew it. From a design perspective, he ends up living somewhere in the uncanny valley the entire runtime. He's pathetic without his helmet. I will say, however, when he's in full armor and has the voice changer, he does look pretty menacing. But again, as we improve in many aspects, we get a bombshell of disappointments on the other end to counteract it and give us an overall mixed bag. To answer the first question, the tomato meter was not right in one side or the other. This is definitely not the worst movie in the MCU or even close to it. I think Thor The Dark World has that prize in every single category. It is also not Endgame. I feel like it falls somewhere in between. But everybody knows that the main attraction for this project is to see Jonathan Majors become Kang the Conqueror and set up the scale of what we're going to see in the next MCU projects. Kang is a baller and he is instantly one of the top three villains that we have gotten in the MCU. So if you're thinking about skipping it, I will say it's definitely enjoyable. I also wanted to let you know that I will be covering those two post credit scenes along with an in-depth spoiler talk analysis of the film in another video. So make sure that you subscribe to the channel with the Naughty Bell on so you can get an instant notification for whenever I post that bad boy. With that said, have you seen Quantumania? What did you think about the movie and what are you excited to see in the next movies? Let me know in the comments down below. Thank you